a verse that is very common that we hear often. You've probably heard multiple sermons uh, talked about, but I just want to break it down in a simplistic form this night or this morning and look at it uh, of how we need to be thinking about if God is going to really do a work. You see, um, we're in very strange times right now. Not only do we have COVID going crazy with lots of things, I, I tomorrow, Lord willing, tomorrow night we'll get on a plane, and uh, it is my anniversary this week, and I had planned when there was no COVID in Texas, hardly at all, I set up a trip that taking my wife down a couple days to San Antonio for our anniversary, and then preaching in uh, Dallas-Fort Worth, and then preaching in Austin next Sunday, and said, oh, this will be great, there's no COVID down there, and now where's the number one hotspot for COVID? And then um, uh, somebody said, hey, have you looked at the weather down in Texas? I said, what? They said, there's a hurricane hitting. <laughs> so, you know, God knows, all right? We have hurricanes. We had a giant flood here, displaced everybody, and it was crazy. Um, we have uh, rioting like I cannot remember in my lifetime and all kinds of struggles. We have a Congress that's split and everybody's fighting over everything. And it, it just seems like everything's all over the place. And often when we face these things, we feel like, you know, there is no hope. Uh, we have this thought of, is anything going to get anywhere? Well, in our you, Steve Currington uh, taught me but way back in the day to use C's and P's in my Bible. Promises and commands. That often as you look through the Bible, you'll see promises and commands. Uh, let's look at, uh, let's start in verse 12 of Second Chronicles chapter 7. The Bible says, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The promise we see here is then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd sure like to see that in our world today. I'd sure like to see there be healing. I'd sure like there, uh, to see that people start getting along. I'd like to see that we're not having to run from disease. I'd like to see that we don't have everybody fighting over uh, all kinds of issues. Is it five feet or is it six feet? Is it 14 days or is it 10 days? Should we wear a mask or shouldn't we wear a mask? And then we have lots of other fights. You know, are you a Democrat or are you Republican or are you nothing? And, you know, we have all these battles everywhere. But he says here, he says that then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. But there are some ifs here, all right? The, it, kind of a command of things to do. He says here that you need to, he said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. You're picking out some of those, the first thing we see there is, he says, my people, and we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, it, it, that you're saved, you take ownership of who you are. The, another thing that we see there is if they pray, we see that if they seek God, we see that they turn from their ways. And it's, it's a process here, he says, that we need to come to God and follow him. If we take and we're saved and we pray and we seek God, guess what's most likely going to happen? We begin one plus two plus three equals four. We turn from our wicked ways. But he uses the word in there, a humbling process must take place in our life. Let's go ahead and pray and we'll get started tonight, to this morning. Lord, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for who you are. Lord, I pray that you would help us 
come to that humbling place where we allow you to do amazing things in our life. Lord, we sure do need you. We can't get victory without you. Lord, I pray now that we would allow you to be alive in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we're always looking for a quick fix. We always look for a magic potion to fix everything in our life. If we just do this, then everything will be better. You watch infomercials and they have the, the best exercise machine that you ever could buy. Has anybody ever bought an exercise machine because you saw that it was the best thing in the world? I can remember when I first got married, I got one of those things where you sat at, down and you put your feet on the stirrups and you held here and it pulled you up and it pulled you down. And it was great the first week. But who wants to every day of their life for half an hour do this, all right? And it wore out. It was just a fad for me, and it went through. From that point on, I've never bought another machine because I realized I didn't want to jump into this machine will fix your entire body, and you'll, you'll look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know? We have these magic potions that if you'll take and you'll buy this. I, I was looking up and reading. A, uh, there is a home remedy kit. It contains 91 of the most commonly used homeopathic remedies as, as well as nine other ones with 200 cc's in them. They're bigger, more powerful. The remedies in this kit will cure stomach bugs, flu-like symptoms, coughs, sore throats, ear pain, morning sickness, uh, diarrhea, seasonal allergies, injuries, first aid, minor arthritis, colic, skin eruptions, and much, much more. And you can get this top 100 kit for $224.99 today on the internet. Wow. Unfortunately, they're, it's so popular, it's temporarily out of stock till August 3rd. So you're just going to have to sit back and wait. You know, that's what our world is built on. It's built on, let's get this fixed now. And our mind frame is, I need to take and I need to get and just fix this and change it all. But revival, a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, a, a changing of your life within is a process. See, we often want to make Christianity just a single destination. And you know what? One day we're all going to be in heaven and that's the destination. But while we're on this earth, there is no destination. It is a process. It is a journey of allowing the Holy Spirit to work within us and change us to create a new life within us. The new creature versus old creature. So we see the first if here says, if my people... If my people, which are called by my name. The first thing we see here is that we must be his people. I challenge you today that if you are not saved, you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, that you become one of his people. I am his child. It's the most important thing that we can do. The, on Friday, I had the opportunity of kind of summarizing everything up with VBS and talk to the kids about the most important things to do on our Christian journey in life. And I said, the first thing to do, what is it? And I, Austin, who just got engaged uh, recently to Roddy Rupel, all excited, yelled out, get married! Of course, we had him set up to do that. But... There's, I think he is six years old, sitting on the front row, and he looks up dead serious, yells out, have babies! <laughs> you know, the fact is we look at a lot of things that are important in our life, but the most important is our identity in Christ of who we are and that we're his child. And it is important that we, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you make sure that. And this week we got to see a lot of kids uh, take and accept Christ. The young man getting um, baptized today, I, I on Friday, said, How many of you are a child of God? You've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. And he raised his hand up real high and says, I did that this week. I was glad that on Friday he had remembered the decision that he had made earlier and knew 
that he was a child of God and knew that he was saved. Today, if you don't know that, I pray that you will. But also with that, we have to realize our identity, that we are his people. One of the reasons that God cannot work in our lives or we do not allow God to work in, his li uh, in our lives is because we don't recognize who we are. We don't recognize the identity that is there. My mother was a... Uh, um, grew up in a little town called Whiting, Indiana, right outside of Chicago. And, and her dad was a lawyer in town, and he was an honest, good lawyer. People trusted him, and he was basically the town's lawyer for that small town. And he would often talk to his children and say, you are a representative of Walter Kekich. He said, because I'm a lawyer, I'm able to give you a good life. But if Walter Kekich's name gets tarnished, nobody will trust me. And I won't have a place to practice law. And he would tell the kids that you represent Walter Keckett. My mother said she grew up not being called Mary Ellen Keckett, but being called Walter Keckett's daughter. And she said it was really good at some time. She got a lot of privilege because of it. But one night she stayed out after curfew. And she was hanging out downtown after curfew. And a policeman picked her up looked at her ID and saw that she was Walter Kekage's daughter, put her in the back of the police car and took her home. And she said she could see her father's face as he's standing at the doorstep. And she realized that that night she had not recognized who she was. She had thought she was just Mary Ellen, but at that point she was Walter Kekage's daughter who had tarnished Walter Kekage's name. The fact is, is we need to realize our identity that we are God's child. We are bought with a price. We are not our own. Our identity is in Christ. And it is important that we recognize that. We need to realize who's in control. I've been ta talking to my Sunday school class about this this morning. See, our identity is what controls us. Our identity is what we live in. There's some of you, you live in the fact that you are Michigan or that you are Michigan State. All right. And yeah, I think I saw, actually, my father-in-law has a Michigan tie on this morning. All right. He's representing today. All right. And my son, Jordan, will often wear his West Coast uh, uh, shirt uh, on. And he'll pick on my other son who goes to Heartland. And he calls them, uh, he says that he has HTTS, holier than thou syndrome. All right. They're claiming their identity in those things. But, you know, the fact is, is do you claim your identity as a child of God? That I'm his people. That I allow my God to move me. And what happens in life, we allow a lot of things to be our identity greater than our God. That greater than our Heavenly Father who, who sent His Son Jesus to die for us. We don't represent that identity. We don't follow that identity. I know there are some people, they're a sports family. They, they put all their eggs in the basket of, we're going to play every sport, we're going to do everything. You know, the fact is, you, then you wonder sometimes why your kids put more emphasis on sports than God. Because that's their identity, maybe. We put our emphasis on maybe being a hard worker, and it's really good to train our kids to be hard workers. But that can't be our identity, we might say, well, we need to focus on our family. And yes, you, you should do a lot of family things. This summer, my kids and I have discovered a new sport. Uh, it's called Can Jam. Anybody ever play Can Jam? And especially during the really restrictive time of COVID, we played every night we were playing COVID. Uh, quit playing COVID. Play, playing Can Jam. <laughs> played Can Jam in COVID. And we were playing Can Jam like crazy. But... You know, none of my kids are going to go play professional can jam. And I, Lord willing, my kids will go serve God. And that, that is where our identity must be. Um, Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me 
and gave himself for me. I hope that my identity is that I am walking in Christ, that I am that new creature, and that I am dying to self. Paul said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It is important that we recognize that we're his people, that I am a child of God. The second if we see here is if I pray, if I pray, how is your communication? How is your communication with others? How is your communication with God? See, we need to recognize that the most important communication that we have is with our almighty God and how he is working in our life. You know, um, there was a husband and wife and they got in a big fight. And they, they, they were going to it and they stopped talking to each other. Two days later, the husband realizes that he needs to get his wife to take him to the airport at five in the morning the next morning. But he is so stubborn, he doesn't want to talk to her. They're giving each other the silent treatment. So he writes on a piece of paper and sets it on top of the place where she, she lays down on the bed and says, please take me to work, or please take me to the airport tomorrow morning at five. Please wake me up. He wakes up the next morning at 9 o'clock. He is furious that she didn't wake him up. She didn't help him get to the airport. And how dare he? That's just another thing, the reason to be mad at her. As he's in his rage trying to get ready and rebook another uh, airport run, a way to get there and the fly out, he looks down and he sees on the paper was written, uh, uh, on the paper next to it, you do it yourself. You know, the fact is, is we fall out of communication with God, too. We sometimes go into that silent treatment, and when there's not communication, we wonder why God's not working. We're really good when we needed some, need something to say, okay, God, here I am. I, I need this. I, I need to communicate with you. But we have to get to the point where we allow God to become so real that we allow him to guide and direct our steps. Psalms 3, one of my favorite psalms, it says, when uh, Psalm when David wrote when he was fleeing from Absalom, he said, Lord, how are they that increase that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God's Selah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. I laid me down and slept. I awake, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of the tens of thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all my enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. We see here that David starts off and he said, Many say there is no hope for me. Many say that things are so against me that I'm gone. And we see often as David writes the Psalms, he's I would say a little bipolar. He starts off at the beginning saying, oh, it's all bad. It's all terrible. But David generally does something interesting in the middle of his passages. In verse 2 or verse 3, he says, but thou, O Lord, art a shield and my glory and the lifter of mine head. He recognized who his God is. And then verse 4, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. He took and he allowed God to be there in the midst of his trouble. He allowed to recognize that he could cry out to him and communicate with his God. And then he allowed God's grace to be there and be sufficient because he said in verse 5, I laid me down and slept for the Lord sustained me. 
You know, that's the relationship, that's the prayer life that we need to have with God, that as we're walking through trials and we're walking through trouble and we're walking through battles, that we allow our God to be there and we allow our God to guide and direct us. Yes, this is a crazy time. Yes, we're facing a lot of unknowns. Yes, we don't know what's going to happen when the school year starts back. But guess what? We have a God who is amazing. We have a God who is willing to sustain us in the midst of the battle and this is awesome because in the next verse he said i will not be afraid of the tens of thousands god didn't take the problem away god's grace was there and he acknowledged that in verse 8 he said salvation belongeth unto the lord if we're going to have revival in our hearts and in our lives and around this country, it starts with us getting in communication with our God and recognizing that we're His child and allowing Him to guide and direct us through our lives. Allowing His grace to sustain us no matter what the trial is, no matter what the battle is. We allow Him to work in and through us. God must be real. When Wilbur J. Chapman was in London, he had an opportunity to meet General Booth, who at that time was uh, past 80 years old. Dr. Chapman listened reverently as the old general spoke of the trials and conflicts and the victories. Then the American evangelist asked the general if he would disclose the secret for his success. He hesitated for a second. And then Dr. Chapman, uh, Chapman said, I saw the tears come into his eyes and stream down his cheeks. And then he said, I will tell you the secret. God has had all, God has was always there all the time for me. There have been men with great brains, greater brains than I, men with greater opportunities. But from the day I got the poor of London on my heart, and a vision of what Jesus Christ could do with the poor of London. I made up my mind that God would have all of William Booth that there was to give. And if there is anything the power in the power of the Salvation Army, it's because of what God has done in my life and the adoration in my heart. All the power of my will and all the influence of my life is because of my God. Dr. Chapman said that he went away from that meeting with General Booth knowing that the greatness of a man's power is the measure of his surrender. We see here that in order to recognize, we have to recognize what God's done in our life and that he, we're his child and our identity. We need to communicate with him. But third of all, we see here that we need to humble and seek his face. We've got to come to a point where we take and we seek Him with our whole heart, surrender and set aside everything else and say, here I am, God. God, I will take and set myself aside and give myself to You. You know, often we take and we want to get focused on everything else except seeking God and seeking after Christ. Colossians chapter 3, the Bible says, in, uh, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. We see here that we have to take and if ye then be risen with Christ, those who are saved need to seek after Christ, set their affections after Christ, and then die and hide themselves in Christ. Do you allow yourself to walk in Him and seek after those things? I love where it says, set your affections on things above. There are often things that we seek but do we set our affection even more so on it that this is what I want to know. This is what I want to learn. This is how I want to figure this out. I mentioned earlier that we started uh, doing can jam and playing that at home. I will tell you, unfortunately, I'm almost 50 years old and I did not know how to throw a frisbee. 
All right, I'm not super coordinated and I didn't know how to do it. So because of that, my kids were killing me. All right, and I wanted to get it. And sad to say, my kids who love me were making fun of the old man. All right. So you know what I did? I started looking online on how to throw a frisbee. I started seeking after that. I talked with uh, Pastor Howell. Did you know Pastor Howell is a great frisbee thrower? You must spend more time studying how to throw a frisbee than reading the Bible, but no, just kidding. <laughs> he can throw a frisbee. And so uh, one day in the office, I asked him, and he told Austin, go find me a frisbee. And in the hallway, he started giving me lessons on how to throw a frisbee, and it worked. Praise the Lord. I sought after it, and I got victory. I can throw a frisbee now. But the Bible and our communication with God ought to be the same way. See, His ways are higher than ours. His ways are much greater than ours. We need to come to a point where we seek it, we search it, we set our affection after it, and we want to know. I said that it's a process and a journey. It's not an arrival point. You're not going to get there just by, oh, I love God, so I'll, uh, I'm going to be a good Christian. No, the fact is, is it's daily getting in God's Word. It's daily allowing God to become alive and getting hungry and seeking after what God has. In the 1800s, a group of women met to study the Bible in Dublin. They were puzzled by the words in Malachi 3.3. And those words are, and he, sit, he shall sit as a refiner and purify, purifier of silver. One of the ladies promised to call on the silversmith and ask him about it and figure out what does that mean, refiner of silver. She went and started talking to the man, and he said, you just need to watch as we do it. So she, he, he, he asked the man, he says, now as you do this. What do you do? And he says, I sit as I work. I don't stand. And he said, well, just watch. So he started refining and then getting into the furnace. And as he's sitting there, he kept looking in. And she realized when he saw the expression on the refiner's face, when he could see himself reflect off of the silver, it was now clean and clear. I propose to you today that knowing that you're in the right place of revival and knowing that you're headed in the right direction is when the image of Christ begins to reflect on your life. When you start walking in Him and being that new creature that you're taking and recognizing that identity, you're praying and communicating, you're seeking after Him, and people see Christ in you. People see a difference in you. Uh, I am not known as a calm, gentle person. My entire life, I, they call me a bull in a china shop. All right, I'm, I'm a mess. I'm all over the place. Uh, I'm loud, boisterous, and uh, rough. And that is my life. And that, I have a personality and very strong. But on my journey over these last 19 years or so of seeking Christ, I've tried to conform more and more to the image of Christ. I was sitting down with somebody who was struggling with accepting the circumstances of their life and ex not getting frustrated with circumstances of their life and treating others with kindness, having great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them, being swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, and practicing the, the word of God. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And I was going through and trying to show them that even though they wanted to react wrong, that they needed to act spiritually and walk in Christ and not allow the things that were hitting them to affect them. And they looked at me and they said, you know, Pastor Scott, they said, hey, you just don't understand it because you're a sanguine. And I said, what? Because a sanguine somebody who is calm, even keeled, not an A personality, and just kind of a follower. And I looked and I laughed at him. It's the first time in my life I've ever been called a sanguine, all right? Those who know me know that's far from me. And I said, I'm not a sanguine. 
They said, no, no. They said, nothing ever bothers you. They said, you're just calm and peaceful all the time. It's not me. And it was interesting because I looked at him and I said, anything you see is because I'm practicing the scriptures that I'm trying to tell you now. And I'm trying to allow the Holy Spirit to control. And he said, well, you're a sanguine now because God did it. He didn't even realize what he was saying. Because he was saying he couldn't be, because he was an A personality, he couldn't practice it. But he just acknowledged that he at least saw some, a little bit of change in me because of Christ. In your life, it can be different. But it's only going to be different if you get into Scripture, get into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You communicate with Him. You humble yourself. You seek Him. And that changes and turns things. That's where it's if I turn from my wicked ways. I said earlier that 1 plus 2 plus 3 equals 4. You know what? That turning comes when we allow God to do the amazing work. See, it's not us who can do the turning. Well, growing up, I saw so many people, they get saved, and the next day they would throw a suit on, and they, they would try to act all right. But they hadn't changed the inside. The fact is, if you have your relationship with God right on the inside, then it'll manifest itself on the outside through God working in you, and those things will change. We have to come to the point that we allow God to do that refining and change us. The story is told of a young girl who accepted Christ as her Savior. She then wanted to become a member of her church, and she was in one of those stinky, snobby churches that wanted to sit her down with the deacons and ask her a lot of questions. So the deacon... Deacon gets up and haughty and asks her and says, Were you a sinner before you received the Lord Jesus into your life? Inquired the old deacon. And she said, Yes, sir, I was. And the deacon looked at her and said, Well, are you still a sinner? And she looked at him and said, Sir, to tell you the truth, I feel I'm a greater sinner than ever. Now, why would she say that? You know, when you walk closer to the light, you can see the darkness better. You can see the dirt better. And it should be that the closer you walk with your God, the more He reveals about the truth about who you are and what needs to change. So the deacon looked at her after that statement that I am a greater sinner than ever and says, then what real change have you experienced? And the young girl replied with, I don't know quite how to explain it, she said. Except I used to be a sinner running after sin. But now that I'm saved, I'm a sinner running from sin. You know, the fact is, is we have to look at where we're headed. Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to convict you, to communicate with you, and to change your thinking? This is true revival. Allowing God to work in and through you and changing your heart. We want things to change in this world, but it begins with us. It begins with us allowing ourselves to recognize who we are in Christ. We have to be that new creature. We recognize our identity in Christ. We're saved. We communicate with Him. We pray and we seek His face. We humble ourselves. And then we begin to turn and change those things that are in our, that are in our life. Today, what do you need? to do to have revival in your life. Let's pray. Lord, we need you in a great way. We can't do this by ourselves. It's you working in and through us. Lord, I pray that today we recognize where we're not allowing you to do a great work. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed to it, say, Pastor Cowling, as you spoke today, I see some areas of my life that I'm in control, that I, maybe my communication with God's not right, maybe my identity in Christ is not right, maybe my walk and my seeking Him is not right, but there's some things that must change. Pray for me. Is there anybody like that? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Who else? There's some things that need to change.
Amen. Some of you, you may not know your identity in Christ. You've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You don't know for sure you're going to heaven when you die. Who would say, Pastor Scott, I need to know for sure I'm going to heaven when I die. I'm not sure about that, but pray for me. Would you raise your hand? Is there anybody like that? I need to know for sure I'm going to heaven. Is there anybody like that? All right. Would you stand with me? In just a moment, I'm going to pray. And if God worked on your heart this morning, revival starts with communication with God and no, not, no better place than to come down to the altar and communicate with Him. Say, God, this is what needs to change. Also, if you need to be saved today, walk down and uh, meet one of the pastors up front and they'll take a Bible and show you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. If you need to be baptized, some of your kids got saved this week. They need to follow the Lord in baptism. We need to obey God in that. Come forward. The baptistry waters are all ready to go. If you need to join the church, come forward. But if you just need to pray, come bend a knee after we pray. Lord, we need you in a great way. Guide and direct our steps. Help us as we seek you. Help us to humble ourselves before you and allow you to work in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Song is whatever it takes. Come forward and do a work with God as the music plays. Many are coming, won't you? Won't you wave that flag and say, God, here I am, I surrender. I give up. I'm done with my control. Who else will come?